Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel. It is episode 266 and I hope you guys are doing really super well. Um, it is Tuesday, May, <laughs> May 2nd and uh, I hope you guys are doing really well. Uh, it's so good to see everybody. There's Dion and uh, uh, it's Lisa, I think, right? Or Liza, Lisa. Um, Dion, Dana, Eve, Suzanne, Glenda, Amanda, Tessa, Diane, it's good to have you guys here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it has been a whirlwind of a couple of weeks and I hope that you guys are well. Uh, I have one finished item. Ah! So that's really exciting. I have a little bit of housekeeping that I just need to share with you guys and um, oh Liza. Liza Minnelli, Liza Minnelli, Liza Minnelli, Liza. Um, <laughs> And uh, you had told me that before and I knew that I wasn't remembering correctly. So thank you, Liza. Um, I have a friend that, that she, instead of the Z, she has an S. So she's Melissa instead of like Elizabeth or, you know, something like that. And um, so she goes by Lissa. And so that's why when I see the Z, I'm like, I want to say Lissa. So um, excuse my tumbling over your name every time I see it, Liza. The, uh, in today's show, so yeah, it's been, it's been a bit of a whirlwind here. Um, the kids have had a ton of soccer and it got really, really warm and really hot. And then it got cold again. I was back in my parka last night at soccer and it's just kind of been one of those like weird, busy springs. I don't know if, do you guys find this, especially those of you who still have kids at home, and maybe those of you who had kids at home or maybe uh, your kids are, are older now or maybe that maybe you're empty nesters. I find in the school year, this, this stretch from the beginning of April, end of March to the end of June is like ridiculous. It is so busy and there is so much packed in and there's all this like end of the year stuff and yet it's June, but of course it's the end of the school year. And I find it's just kind of exhausting. Um, I don't particularly enjoy it. The weather is still really borderline, like it starts off cool in the morning, it can get warm by the afternoon, or it can get cold and rainy as the day goes on. Like it's really up and down. Even Dion says the weather here is crazy. Um, where she is, she's just outside of Chicago. Um, and I just find that like by this time of year, like I am done. <laughs> I just want quiet, days. I want a break from everything. I want the kids to go to some summer camps so that they have something fun to do in the morning and then we have quiet afternoons. Like I'm ready for that change in routine. I don't know if that makes sense. I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, weird spring here too. Uh, Di Diane is in uh, Oregon um, and absolutely the time of year, last of the school year is um, very difficult. It's so true. Yeah, move to... <laughs> Um, Amanda says move to Australia. The school year runs January to December. So everything lines up. I, this is probably a bit controversial. I would love year round school uh, where the kids have like strategic breaks throughout the year rather than going 10 months of the year because it's not really 10 months of the year because it gets so eroded. I would love the kids to go to year round school where we get a bit of time off in August, a bit of time off in December, and then a bit of time off in March. That would be like my or April, I guess, I would way rather go more like a university um, calendar. I think it makes the most sense. I think it sets up the kids for a lot of success in their adult lives. Um, it's not like in your adult life, most people don't get big, big chunks of two and three months off at a time unless you're a teacher. And yeah, I would just, I would love to go, I would love to have the kids have an adjusted school schedule that they went year round and that, you know, they came back at some point and now you're in the next grade. <laughs> Just be, and it's more fluid and a little bit more consistent with sort of what the rest of the world does. Um, Dion says, I'm totally with you on year round school. Suzanne says, I totally felt that when raising my kids. I loved when they were little, but the business got to me a lot at times. Totally. Um, I think that's a lot of what's getting to me right now is just the, the, all the other stuff as well as getting getting it done. So thank you for listening to me wax poetic about all of this stuff. Uh, I, uh, I think we should just roll the credits and get into the show and I'll see you guys on the other side.
Diane says that she loved summers off because she had lots of handy workers on the farm. See, I can see that if you're in like farming or if you've got a lot of property or something, that I can see. And if we lived close to my in-laws who are in rural Ontario, um, my kids would have a blast just working with my father-in-law out on, on the farm. So that I can see, that I can see. <laughs> All right, I have some announcements to make before we get into um, all of the things. So this month on Wool and Spinning, I am so excited. I was sort of a little bit covetous about um, announcing this uh, back at the end of April. I just wanted to make sure that everything went off without a hitch and that we got everything recorded, that we were able to, to match up our schedules and get things done. But on Wilson and I were able to get together a couple of weeks ago and we recorded a very um, uh, really important po podcast about an important project that she's working on called the Loving Blanket Project. So that is this month's Wool and Spinning Radio. It is available wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Audible, wherever you like to collect your podcasts, it is available. So please go ahead, have a listen, and I really hope that we will see some project squares in that blanket from Wool and Spinning. I've even thought about this summer I'm planting the seed. If this speaks to anybody, please let me know. Leave a comment down below. Um, I've even thought about maybe coordinating with you guys one or two mornings in the summer where we could have like a maker morning, but it's a blanket, a loving blanket morning where we all have our materials and stuff organized or maybe you come to our little gathering um, for an hour where we actually make our squares together. And uh, they're, they need to be six by six, so that finished, they'll be five by five inches. And I thought, you know, what a cool way to participate in the project in the way that On is really hoping for, which is that people will come together, have co in conversation, in celebration, um, as a way to heal, as a way to share grief. Um, and I think that, you know, this transcends um, indigenous cultures, non-indigenous cultures, uh, borders, um, of course, our indigenous communities don't really, they, they don't recognize borders. They see Turtle Island as, as one, um, one, one landmass. And I just thought maybe that would be a way for us to come together and, and to participate in this project. So the idea is that it's a community art project that, um, that, that everybody participates in that, and that we work together on something and that, you know, hopefully eventually it'll be housed somewhere. So, uh, uh, Liza says it was an excellent podcast, really thought provoking and informational. I'm really glad, uh, Liza. Thank you for saying that. Um, on, I could talk to her all day after we finished the like actual podcast about the loving blanket project. We got into this whole conversation about books and whatnot. And I had to go cause the kids had to go to soccer and we were just having a blast chit chatting with each other. She is a wonderful human being and it was really, really fun to talk to her. So, um, Alberto says he's almost done listening to it today. That's wonderful. Thank you. You guys for, for listening. We also have our year of color. For those of you who are seasoned around here and know sort of what's going on, you know all about well, uh, year of color, but I know for, for somebody who's new and just watching this, uh, our year of color is going on from January to December. We're exploring all things color. Rebecca is talking about um, color on the wool circle, but right now she's talking about it in the context of wool combing. So that went live yesterday for our patrons. And then the warm cold contrast is coming soon. It will be, um, I haven't actually uploaded it yet, but it's coming, uh, I think it's coming next, next Thursday. So it'll be a week and a bit from now from when this is being recorded. Um, and of course, all the links to all the Year of Color stuff and everything, all the past stuff, you can you can check out in the down bar below. Um, coming up, we've got a Maker Morning tomorrow morning. So for those who are generally there on Wednesday mornings, uh, the first Wednesday of each month, Maker Morning, it's tomorrow morning. I will send out the post later today. And then we've got Queries and Explorations this, this coming Saturday. We've been talking about wool combing recently and Spinning Staples is next Wednesday, the second and fourth Wednesday of every month for the, anybody who's in that group. And, uh, and then of course on the last, the last, uh, uh, Tuesday of the month at the same time as the wool, as, as the live stream, uh, we've got, um, sort of applying all of the theory that we're going to learn this month about warm, cold contrast. We're going to apply all of that and we're going to, uh, have a, a premiere on the last Tuesday of the month. So I hope that you guys check out all of that and, um, participate with us. That would be wonderbar. I would love to have you. Um, all right. 
Before I move on, I just wanted to put a plug out for book club. So we have our last book club meeting coming up pretty quick here. Uh, it's coming up. I don't think that Becca is here today, but it's coming up pretty quick and we're reading The Secret River. I have finished. I really enjoyed this book. Again, it's about Indigenous culture in Australia, about the European settler, well, not European, the British um, criminals that um, um, that settled. It's from the perspective of one of those men and sort of what happens to him and the things that happen with the um, uh, the indigenous peoples that live in the area that they end up um, uh, claiming land. So uh, very thought provoking, provoking book. We've had some really wonderful conversations in book club about this. And if you would like to join book club, it's the hashtag cha books channel on Slack. And we are currently, uh, Becca's compiling all of the ideas for our next book. So if you have any ideas about what you might want to read next, please uh, don't hesitate to throw that into the books channel. And she's got quite a list going right now and then, and then she'll sort of compile them and we'll have a look and see what sort of resonates and what we want to do next. So because I finished The Secret River, I, al I also finished The Last Apothecary. I figured out, I have to share this with you guys, I figured out why I stumbled so badly on the last on apothecary uh, apothecary uh, when i said it last show and i couldn't get it out i realized after the live stream i hope you guys find this um humorous i figured out that i've always said apothecary apothecary so i put a c in there like an extra syllable apothecary and I've always said it that way and when I was sitting there sit, talking to you guys looking at the book I was like this isn't spelled right <laughs> and that's why I had that cognitive like dissonance of like what is going on so it's apothecary not apothecary <laughs> Anyways, I've moved on. I loved it. It was wonderful. It was a great book. It's a real um, women's book written for women. Um, very dark humor. And now I've moved on to the Jane Austen Society. Those of you who've been um, in the wool and spinning community for a while, you know how much I love Jane Austen. And uh, Pride and Prejudice is probably one of my favorite, favorite books. And um, I, my mom gave this to me. She bought it for me at the Mennonite uh, thrift shop out in, um, it's way out in the east um, in uh, the uh, um, upper Fraser Valley, like quite far. And her and her friends go there all the time because there's all sorts of like fabric and they have um, um, like all this, it's a really, really good store. Um, and they have, yeah, a lot of stuff, a lot of furniture, which my mom isn't buying, but like a lot of fabric ends and books and you can get so many really, really good stuff. Anyway, she saw it sitting there and she bought it for me for 50 cents. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. It's wonderful. It's by Natalie Jenner, if, for those of you who don't, um, aren't familiar with her. Uh, she's a uh, Canadian author. She's born and raised in Britain and ended up in Canada. She lives in Toronto. Uh, yeah, raised in Canada, born in England, and uh, they currently live in, in in Toronto. So anyhow, highly recommend. All right, what else do I have to cover? Our SOS giveaway. So School of Sweet Georgia. Um, I have my Camelids course that just went live. And uh, this is the Camelids spinning kit for for that's offered with the workshop. And so I'm giving that away. Um, I will send it out to you guys. Tori, if you are watching this, I have not sent your uh, yours out just yet. Um, I'm, I need to find a mailer, something to put it in, and I can't find anything that's the right size. So I need to find five so that I can put all of these in the same one and send them all out to all of you guys. So all I need you to do to enter to win is to, en is to fill in the Google form. I've just put it in the live chat, so you guys should be able to follow that link and answer the question give me a way to get in touch with you and we'll be good to go. Christine says adding the Jane Austen Society to my book list. There's another one, the Paris Bookshop, I think is another book that I'd really like to read that um, I think it was Florence recommended. So there was another one, um, apo <laughs> Apocalypse, hard when you need to switch to Apotha. <laughs> it's so true, Diane. I love your play with words. I know you always, um, you, that teacher in you, you've got that great way with words. All right, so that is it for all of the information. Now, because it has been such a busy few weeks and it's been, there's been just lots and lots going on, I wanted to share with you guys um, 
uh, sort of what our last two weeks have looked like and some of the things that we have done. And I think it's just really fun for you guys to be able to see kind of a behind the scenes of like what my life looks like when I'm not making, uh, when we're doing all the other things that we do. So I hope that you enjoy this. So thank you for um, entertaining me. Um, I, I walk a lot and um, I just thought, you know, it would be really, really fun to bring you guys along 
um, sometimes sort of going forward because I really try to get out daily for a walk and um, we all live in such different places in the world and it's just fun like I I'm I drive an unbelievable amount <laughs> and I am like we're in Vancouver and we're in Abbotsford and we're in North Vancouver and we're in you know Surrey and we go to Burnaby and like we're everywhere and I just thought um, what a fun way to kind of start to share with you guys um, what kind of happens like what our life looks like it's one thing to say oh yeah we're really busy <laughs> it's like well we're not really that busy I get out for an hour walk every day like so sort of sharing that with you guys so I hope that that's I hope that that's helpful I hope that that's meaningful and, and I'll, I'll keep doing it okay so let's talk about projects so I have finished my let me just share with you give you guys something to look at while I'm talking so this is my M's and W's stole that I've been working on. It's been on my Ashford 16 shaft table loom for the last number of months. It's taken way longer than I thought that it would, which has actually been kind of a bummer because I was really hoping that I would have this, that it would be a quick win, that I would get it on the loom, do a little bit of sampling, and then move on to another project. My plan with this is the, the 16 shafts all have to be like lined up basically. So what I thought was I'll put on a four shaft project and line up the first four shafts and then I'll do an eight shaft project and I'll wind and I'll do the next four shafts so that I'll have eight lined up and then a 12 shaft and then a 16 shaft and by the time I get to the 16th shaft, the 16 shaft project for four projects down the road, it'll all be lined up and kind of ready to go. The problem is that I need to get more heddles. So I'm actually going to take a project that's upstairs on my Louette spring off of the spring and put it onto this loom. It's a four shaft project again, but I really need to get the other project done. It's for my OHS stuff and for my Ontario hand weavers and spinners, master weaver stuff. And um, I, I need to get it off the spring and off of the counter marsh because there's too much going on and I have to be constantly changing the tie up. Um, so what the treadles are doing, it's just too complicated. For those who aren't weaving yet, don't worry about what I'm talking about with the treadles and the spring and everything. It's just, I need a direct lift plan, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. And I want to put that project on this loom. So I'll talk about that more in the future once it's moved. But in the meantime, this ended up sitting on my loom for a long time. And there was a couple of reasons for that. Once I got going with the weaving and after I did that initial sampling, I kind of lost momentum with it. I just lost the joie de vivre with it. So this was all spindle spun Cormo that I spun and I, I thought that I had included photos of all of that spinning and I, I don't see them cycling through so I'm wondering if they didn't add properly. My goal was to spin all of this um, through, was it 2022 was, was my goal to have it all spun. And um, of course I can't find any of the photos. Maybe that's why it didn't work. I wonder why it didn't come up, why it's, why the photos are missing. I'm just gonna have a quick look here, you guys, because um, nothing is coming up and it should all be here. Maybe it's here, ah, huh. <laughs> That is why the photos were not in the right spot. So let's try that. Okay, so um, the photos were moved. <laughs> Note to self, when I'm trying to make things easier, I often make things more complicated. So, so um, this Cormo was originally, this fleece was originally um, raw. I bought it from my friend Sarah Elizabeth of Sarah Elizabeth Fiberworks and she's located just outside of uh, Nelson, British Columbia in Rosland and um, I had it processed by my friend Liz at um, Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks in Vermont. So it kind of went on a bit of a tri uh, trip this fleece because it originally came from Montana and I decided last year in 2022 that I was going to learn how to support spindle spin and I wanted to get to the end of the year having this Cormo totally spun and it was actually Dorothy who said I was having no luck with it on my wheels it just was so fine and the crimp was so fine and the pencil roving was lovely but it just nothing seemed to work and Dorothy said to me one spin group she was like well why don't you just change 
the tool. And I was like, what do you mean change the tool? And so I got thinking about it and I thought, well, yeah, like change, change the tool. So I started support spindle spinning it and it was perfect. And so I, I kept on spinning and kept on spinning and kept on spinning. And I ended up in total, I meant to look this up and I totally forgot. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, I ended up with a total of, yeah, 2,057 <laughs> yards from 285 grams. So it was 250, basically 250, 250 yards out of what, what ended up being uh, 285 grams. So I had enough of fine fingering weight yarn to really do something with. And I thought, you know, I'd really like to start weaving with my hand spun. My long-term goal is that all of my projects or the majority of my projects will be in hand spun, whether it's woven or knit. And um, when I checked the wraps per inch of this, it was roughly about, now I'm gonna forget, I think it was about 20, 28 or 32. It was like right in there somewhere. And so I thought, yeah, it was 32. So I thought, well, to set it at for a twill, um, you know, I could probably sort of play around with the idea of, of you know, some sort of a simple twill. And um, I could make a big stole, like something I could, you know, really kind of wrap around me in the winter that'd be cozy. It wouldn't get a lot of wear and tear. The, I, don't, I don't think that this will withstand a lot of abrasion and a lot of rubbing, um, like the underarms of a sweater. And I had plied it up as a two ply and I just thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should just embrace doing something on one of my looms with it. And I thought, you know, something I've wanted to do for a really super long time was something with a complicated, more complicated twill pattern, not just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or not just a point twill, one, two, three, four, three, two, one. I wanted to do something a little bit more like showcasing one of the twills that kind of almost looks like, is, is brocade the right word? Would that be the right word for these types of fabrics that they look like? Um, I'm not sure that's the right word. But um, I took the warp, I wound the warp, and I dyed it with marigold. So I made a marigold um, slurry. I put it through cheesecloth to uh, you know, get rid of all the residue and all the powder and whatnot. And um, I bought the, the marigold from Maiwa here in Vancouver. Uh, it's local to me. And after dyeing the warp, it was it was quite full, like it wasn't felted or anything. I could still pull things apart. Oh, maybe damask is more what I'm thinking of. Um, but the 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 yarn was definitely like it had changed, and I was really gentle with it, and I really tried to be gentle. The the other photos are still not uh, rotating through. So let me see if I can. I wonder why why they're not rotating through to see sort of what they look like. Um, so weird sometimes, hey, how things just, you think they're working and then they don't. So these are all the, all the spindle photos. So you guys can look at those now. Um, so I took the warp and it definitely had changed um, a bit in the, in the dyeing process. And because I had warped, the, like I had already made the warp and I dyed it in the warp. Um, there, there was definitely changes that didn't happen to all of the yarn. And cause I left the weft undyed and I wanted to see what would happen if I sort of created this overall very neutral sort of very low contrast um, between the white weft and the uh, warp, the, the yellow of the warp, that golden warm yellow. And I, I love M's and W's. I love Rose Path. I love uh, Bird's Eye when they're all woven as threaded and woven. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, I just love the pattern that is created, like the, just the overall feel of it, the overall look. I just, I just think it's wonderful. And I, I like this sort of to me, it feels old. If it, the fabric looks and feels ancient somehow, I don't know how else to describe it. And I just wanted to showcase that and to really help to sort of have something that I felt like was just warm and, and, and interesting and, and was fun to weave, to be honest. 
Yeah, Trump is red. I'm gonna go through it in a minute, Dion. That's why I didn't start using some of the some of the language. Um, I didn't want to uh, start to confuse people before we like set some set some intention, set some sort of ground rules. So this was all of the spinning, and then when I got to the actual weaving, I realized <laughs> when I after I applied, I felt like some of the plying was not quite matching up. Like I felt like some of the yarn was like. Mm, this doesn't really feel like it's really plying together. So I think some of the spindle spun yarn, I combined supported spindle spun yarn and suspended spindle spun yarn and wheel spun single. So like this yarn was a Heinz 57 of a whole bunch of different spinning. It just so happened that it was consistently spun to the same thickness. But I think some of it was S spun, some of it was Z spun, and then I plied it S. And so some of it just, it, I know that it's like basically been applied. It's not really plied properly. <laughs> so I thought, well, we'll see what this does on the loom. We'll see what happens. And nothing happened. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but like, honestly, nothing happened. <laughs> it's like totally fine. So um, these were my initial samples. I talked about these on the show. Um, this first one was trying to get like set. So trying to figure out sort of how hard I needed to be, where I, what I needed to do and what it needed to look like. So this has actually not been wet finished. This is just, um, maybe if I zoomed in, you guys will really be able to see. Um, this is not wet finished. And you can see down here that it's too loose. It's too open. Um, the floats are just kind of hanging out there, nothing nestled together or, or interlaced nicely. Whereas up here, I was starting to get it a little bit better and it was starting to sort of look like it more should. But again, very low contrast, very, very, yeah, very low contrast. And then this one was actually washed and finished and it has a lovely feel, it has a lovely hand to it. And from a distance in real life, not on the camera, you can see the pattern. Um, so unfortunately on the camera, it's too low contrast for you guys to be able to see. And I'm hoping that I can get some photos once it's, once it's finished. Um, I'm hoping I can get some photos to show you guys. I had a little teeny tiny bit of warp left at the end and um, I set these at 21 ends per inch, 21 picks per inch once I got the fabric that I liked. Like this was too loose. This was more like 18 picks per inch. So then at the end, I started to just play and I did a little sample here. This is broken twill. So this is a uh, threading of M's and W's and then broken twill for the, for the treadling. And I was just playing and it was, it was really fun to see these like areas of texture sort of emerge that wouldn't have otherwise emerged. And uh, it just gave me like one more, one more sort of piece of cloth with information. And it's, it's really pretty. And it's got a lovely hand to it. Lovely, lovely feel. A little bit more open. You can't squoosh down broken twill quite to the same extent because of how the interlacement works. It doesn't nestle together like, like these other twills do. So you end up with one, two. And then when you go to four, it just doesn't let you beat the wool against each other quite to the same extent. So you end up with just a slightly more open fabric, just ever so slightly. You can beat it hard and try to get that set and get that 21 picks per inch to match your, your 21 um, ends, ends per inch, but I didn't bother. It's a sample. I just was like, I'm just gonna beat it till it, fe like just how it feels good. And uh, I think it ended up being closer to 20, like 19, picks per inch and it, it's just made a really really lovely fabric that's slightly warp faced it's slight ever so slightly warp warp dominant which is really fun and this is all I have left my little bitty skein that's all I have left so I used I, my math was correct I pretty much did did it correctly um and I and I was able to uh to to use up my my goal was to use up most of the yarn and and I did so I wanted to talk a little bit, so for those who aren't weaving yet, I know somebody else commented on it. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how I like came up with this. So we're gonna kind of go into teaching mode for a minute, okay? Um, so bear with me, if you are not a weaver, this, this is still really great information to know because this is how jeans are made. So if you're wearing jeans right now, look at your jeans because they might not be a four, like a, a, a four shaft twill, they're, they're usually a three shaft twill. Um, but it's really fun to start to kind of be able to look at fabric and be like, oh, I know how, like I know how that's made. Um, I might not be able to make it myself yet, but I, 
there's an opportunity here to just kind of start to understand how fabrics are made. And I really wish coming into weaving, I had known some of this stuff, like even in just like a very rudimentary way, because I think my learning curve has been even steeper. Um, it's because I tried to take on shaft weaving along this, all, alongside of learning weave structures, and that's a big learning curve unto itself anyways. Um, I didn't stick with the rigid heddle for particularly long, so I'm just planting that seed. Um, so even if you're not a weaver, this is, this is a great opportunity for you. So when we're talking about shaft weaving, on the very far side there in the in the corner, um, we've got our tie up. And so that's what's going on underneath your loom on your treadles. Or if you're on a table loom, that's what's going on up top with your with your paddles. Um, the way that this particular twill, when you look at the pattern is threaded, it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And most twills are sort of based off of this. This is like a starting point. And I, I, it's, then you can build off of that. And so the threading up top is the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's in the white because that gives you an idea of it's high contrast with that beautiful blue purple. And um, then you can see what's going on in the warp. So what I did in my project was the yellow was the warp. So that was how it, I didn't thread it one, two, three, four, but, but that was kind of where I started in, in the software. I was like, okay, hey, if I start with one, two, three, four, then I can go from there. Now down the lower uh, right hand side there is also one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So Dion um, alluded to this earlier, that's trompe is writ. So it's threaded the way that it's treadled. So if you're on a table loom and you're starting on a table loom, which is a great place to start because you really understand what's going on with your threads. When you have to manually lift them rather than just pushing a treadle, you really see what's happening. And that's actually why I'm taking that project off of my spring and putting it on a table loom. I need to see what's going Going on and what's lifting and what's lowering. So um, when we lift treadle one there um, at the at the top there on the right hand side, both one and two shafts one and two are going to lift if we're on a jack loom. I'm not going to confuse things with the rising shed and, and all of that. And sorry, with uh, counterbalance and stuff and and lowering, we're just going to stick with rising shed looms, table looms. They lift up um, jack looms. So we're going to lift threads one and two, and then our weft is going to travel under two, over two, all the way across. And then we're going to lift, and then we're going to put those back down, and we're going to lift the next one, number two, which is two and three. And we're going to lift two and three, all those threads go up, and our thread goes over and under, over and under. So I was looking at this, and I was kind of trying to envision it, you know, low contrast with the yellow. I was changing the color bars, and I was sort of like, yeah, 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 kind of like this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, I sort of pivoted a little bit from there because I was like, I really want this to look more like something um, that is um, has a little bit more texture to it and a little bit more interest in where I can sort of take some of these compli more complicated twills and sort of put them into practice a little bit. So I decided to do this. So now can you guys see my mouse here? It's traveling around. So this was what I started with, was the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I don't want to completely leave people behind, but I think it's really important to be able to see, oh, hang on, got to get rid of that. I think it's important to see, that's where I started. So this is your threading up here, and then this is the um, treadling over here. So down the right hand side again. So I sort of took that and I, I started to change it and I put it into what's called M's and W's. So M's and W's is where you actually literally see an M, like there's an M here, right? And then there's a W, but it's really just extended twill um, because after shaft one, when you go to shaft one, shaft four comes afterwards. In the twill circle, it just keeps going around and around and around. And we can talk about the twill circle one, one episode if you guys want to, and we can really fully understand what that means. But it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Like it just goes around and around and you can go the other way. Um, you can go back this way, you can go forward, you can go back, but if you go across the circle, that's broken twill because we've broken the circle. So uh, think of M's and W's as sort of like, a, it's just an extension of the twill circle where we're going a little bit further this way um, because we're going from one down to four and then we're, we're going the other way. We're going from one, you know, two, one, two, we're going back 
we're still going in the circle. We're still, but we're not going quite as far. We're only going to shaft three and then we're going back down again. But we're sticking with the circle. We're just kind of, you know, doing these, these sort of, you know, we're going back and forth basically. And so I took that and I still left it with straight draw and you get M's and W's on your fabric, which is really cool. Um, so you can thread M's and W's or you can treadle M's and W's um, with your straight draw. So you, I could have um, left this threaded one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and I could have treadled M's and W's, which is down here on your lower right hand side, and I would have gotten that same fabric, but now it's turned on its side. And that, during my OHS, during my level one, my unit one, that was like a big aha moment for me because it was really seeing that and understanding that at the loom was all of a sudden like, okay, now I get it. But what I really love is this pattern down here in the corner. It's this, this is what was like, yes. <laughs> Yes, um, treadled and threaded M's and W's. And so it makes the treadling a little bit more complicated. It's not as straightforward. You, I had to pay attention. Shaft one, you know, one, two, two, three, three, four, three, you know, four, one, three, four. Like I had to really keep track of that. And the way that I do that is I actually assign a number. So this is number one, number two, number three, number four, number three, number two. And you have to just memorize that number two is two, three, and number three is three, four, and number one is one, four. You just have to memorize that when you're on a table loom and you're manually lifting everything. But the nice thing about that is that I just had it on a sticky note in front of me, like literally in front of me like this, written one, two, three, four, one, two, three, two, one, um, sorry, uh, one, two, three, four, three, three, two, three, four, and, and just so on, like all listed across on my sticky note. And I had another sticky note and I just moved it across. <laughs> Every time I finished four, I moved it across. No more complicated than that. And that kept me organized. It kept me moving forward. Um, every time I did one of these repeats, which is, which from, for me, a repeat was all the way through two M's and two W's. This was a whole repeat here. And when I did one of those, it was about two inches of weaving. I would say to myself, I've done my two inches. I can get up and walk away if I want to. And nine times out of 10, I sat there and did another 15 inches. So that was actually what got the momentum going. It was, it was Lisa saying, just sit down and throw the shuttle once because you will sit there and you'll throw the shuttle a hundred more times. And when she said that to me, I was like, yes, you are absolutely right. I need to do that. And so I sat, every time I sat down, I said, I'm just going to do a repeat. And inevitably I did like five repeats. <laughs> So I'm sure you guys want to see what this looks like up close. If I can answer any questions before we go on, please jump into the chat. I have to catch up now because I had to take chat off of my screen for a moment. So, wow, looked, look at that graphic through the wrong part of my glasses <laughs> and everything went swimmy. One of the things actually, that's funny that you would say that, Christine. One of the things that I have found really, really helpful when I'm looking at those patterns and looking at those graphics is I actually blur my eyes. Um, so I will actually intentionally blur my eyes or I'll put on Mike's glasses because he um, has, um, he actually wears reading glasses since he had his eyes done and had his lenses and cataracts all done because my he had um, severe, severe cataracts in both eyes. So when he had his lenses done, um, he, um, um, he only needs uh, reading glasses now. And so every so often I'll put on one of his like, you know, 0.25 or 0.75, and it blurs everything just enough that I can really see the pattern underneath. So um, Dion is asking, how did I thread it again? So the way that I threaded it was um, just in case anybody else missed it, I threaded it M's and W's and I treadled it Tromp is writ. So I threaded it M's and W's and that's what gave me this graphic down here. So I threaded it M's and W's up here and I treadled it, Tromp has writ, M's and W's, and that's what gave me um, this pattern here. Because if I had done straight draw and I'd left it straight draw in my original design process, I would have gotten the M's and W's pattern, M's, W's, M's, W's, um, by treadling M's and W's, or if I had left it 
threaded M's and W's and just treadled it point twill, uh, or sorry, uh, straight draw, I would have ended up also with M's and W's on my cloth, but in the warp. And uh, I didn't want that either. I wanted this down here, which is like sort of, I don't know, would you guys describe this as like a faux damask or a faux, faux brocade? Like, I don't know, it just has that look and I don't know what the right word is to kind of use to describe that, but Diana Twist had a beautiful sh uh, scarf that she bought at a recent sale and it was a, um, uh, I think it was cotton in the warp or cotton in the weft and then a wool warp and a wool, one of them was cotton, one of them was, was wool, warp and weft in a beautiful shawl, uh, um, sort of scarf that was, that was, I think it was rose path, I'm not sure it was M's and W's, but same thing, like you get these just beautiful twill like pa twill patterns and they just, the, the richness of them. They're a little bit boring to treadle after a while because you're sort of like one, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, three, two, one. Like it's sort of, you know, it's not some of the, like like if, if, you're, if you're a production weaver, I heard this from a friend recently, um, if you're a production weaver and you are, trying to make money. The really the only way to do that is is plain weave. If you're doing it manually and you're not doing it on a dobby loom. It's because it, you you really only have time to do a b a b a b a b um if you're going to earn money. Um and so some of these twills they're they're really fun to do and uh, I really enjoy doing them but you know they are a little bit more time consuming to uh treadle. And thankfully I'm not trying to do it as a production weaver and I'm not trying to make money and all that kind of stuff but still so I, I threaded it M's and W's and I treadled it M's and W's. How did people manage before sticky and post-it notes? Honestly, Christine, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. So uh, Dion says, I'm planning a coat on mine right now. Yes, I remember you were planning your coat for to, to warp on your rigid heddle. Can't wait to see that. Um, that's going to be amazing. Um... Oh, that's wonderful, Dion. She says, um, I love that you've included so much weaving earlier on because my knowledge has grown from watching the show. That's awesome, Dion. Thank you. Resistance is futile. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's always an opportunity, you guys. There's always an opportunity. And even if you don't want to weave and you, it's not something that you want to do, um, it's always an opportunity to learn, right? Like you don't have to weave to understand how it works and, and understand a different fabric construction. That's, that's, I think more, more what I'm, what I'm kind of going for. Uh, Eve says Rachel's master plan is to make us all weavers. I'm not sure I want you guys to all be weavers necessarily. I think it's more like, um, um, just understanding how fabric works and, and how we can make different fabrics. Um, yes, yellow. Uh, the low contrast is almost like shadow knitting. Yes, yes. Um, and this, this yellow is so warm, like even next to this, it's very, very warm. Um, it's just such a lovely warm yellow. So let me, um, move this and I'll give you guys a little bit of a close up of, of Diana. So I'll just move over a little tiny bit. So this is the finished stole and I, I'm, I, unfortunately the camera just does not pick up. It's not washed and finished yet, but I did get the fringe done. I was very proud of myself and um, yeah, it's really too bad that you can't really see, but maybe that will give you guys an idea. Is that, is that detailed enough that you guys can see that, um, that beautiful, like you can see the, the movement of the pattern going up, like you, you can see it. Um, at first on the loom, because it is very low contrast, I was, I thought I had made threading errors. I was like, for sure there's threading errors. There's no way that this is correct. It was correct. <laughs> I just had to look at it. And I have to admit, weaving with hand spun and weaving like with wool, um, uh, it's something that I really have to practice, like that I practice and that I, that I really pay attention to, but I was really happy with my selvages. Um, your wool selvages are, are never going to be quite as good as your cotton selvages. And, um, to be honest with you, I was really, really happy with how these came out. I'm curious to see what they'll look like once, once they're done. I did use floating selvages. That's the other piece that I wanted to mention. You do need a floating selvage with this. So that's it. And you can see like even from a distance on my camera, at least I can see the, you know, the 45 degree, like I can see how it moves on that twill diagonal. Like I can see the twill diagonal 
you can see kind of the graphic nature of it. Like, you know, we're really designing in and on squares and rectangles. So like that's, you know, it's squares and rectangles and 45 degree angles. Like that's kind of what we're working with when we're weaving. So um, it does simplify it a little bit. So that's it. It is 75 inches long plus five inches of fringe on either end. And it's got a lovely, lovely um, uh, drape to it, although it's not finished yet. And because I had already dyed this, I, um, I think that I will probably um, finish it in, in lukewarm water very gently. Um, I don't want this to full very much because this is going to be completely lost. And yes, there are a couple of areas that I made some treadling errors um, where I went too far and I did an extra one, two, three, four, um, and I did not unweave them. <laughs> I left them. So just one more time. This is sort of what it looks like. I'm really happy with this and I'm happy to be able to talk to about it here. So thank you for letting me wax poetic about it and share with you um, a, a, a big final project. So that is it. All right, so let's chat really quickly about pressed flowers. I have progress. Oh, I have a couple of questions. I love how subtle it is. You can really see it. Yes, thank you. Oh, when you hold it up to the camera, you can really see the contrast in the pattern. Even in real life, it's not super contrasty. Like even in real life, it's not really super like, you know, um, um, like, you know, this is the finished fabric here from my original sample. And this is after wash, washing and fulling it. And even then, like, you know, a lot of it's lost, which is why I want to finish it very gently. This I intentionally fold just very gently. And like in real life, you can see some of the patterning, but a lot of it is lost. You can see it there. Can you, if you blur your eye, if you can see it there on the angle, but it's very, very subtle. And as soon as I go flat, it's kind of lost, but on the angle, you can see it. I love fabric. <laughs> just I could talk about it all day um, will you give it a hard press probably I was actually wondering about just pressing it and not like getting it wet like I was almost wondering about just steam pressing it gently and not um, putting it submerging it in water do you know what I mean like just I was yeah I was sort of curious about doing that um, I haven't done anything. I did do this one. The broken twill sample was washed and finished in lukewarm water. And um, I actually quite liked what it looked like finished because nothing, the, the weft didn't full and uh, it stayed a little bit more true to pattern. Like you can actually see the broken twill. I can see it because I know what I'm looking for. But um, yeah, it kind of made me pause and think about how I maybe wanted to do that. So M's and W's would make a, yes, absolutely, Dana. And I wish uh, for a lovely fabric for a coat. And I also wondered about for a cardigan, a woven wool cardigan with this high contrast, like black and white or black and dark gray or uh, a warm brown with a cream. I mean, oh, steam pressing sounds good, especially since it's not a high wear item. Yes, you could always steam it first. And then if you aren't happy, wet finish it later. That's a great idea, Ashley. I think I will do that, you guys. And I'll report back. All right. Okay. So, um, pressed flowers. This is pressed flowers. This is it finished. This is Amy Christopher's Christopher's version. Um, beautiful yarn, beautiful kind of gray, uh, cold gray. And, uh, she used just a beautiful yarn to go with it. And I lengthened mine slightly. And, um, because my torso is so long, I've talked about that locks on the podcast. We won't go into that. I did finish the button band. Finally, I don't have buttons for it just yet. Um, there's that yet again, but I will have buttons for it and I'll be able to uh, put the buttons on. So I did go back and re-knit all of this. I refinished it. I redid it all. Um, and it's much, much, much better now. I sewed it on. I really intentionally spent time working on this sweater. Um, it's been constantly and consistently put on the back burner and, and other things have been chosen. And I just thought, nope, I'm going to make it a priority. This is my priority and I am off Sleeve Island. So I missed one, but you know, really when you're wearing it, you won't notice. Right now you notice because it's flat and it's at the front, but I missed one of the one of the flowers and I was down here when I realized and I was like, this sweater has just been one thing after another. I am leaving it. I am not redoing it. So 
it has a missing flower. Um, and didn't they used to do that in like Roman tile work? They would e e intentionally make a mistake and leave a tile or like not do the pattern in that tile and leave it blank um, just for visual interest. <laughs> Tell me that's the case and that that's true and then I can like rest easy. Anyways, the sleeves turned out really well. I did go up a needle size for the sleeves after, I can't remember who it was in our community, maybe it was Martha, mentioned about going up a needle size. And I've, I haven't really ever had to do that for my gauge before, but I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna give it a try and sure enough, it, it really, it worked really well. And then I'm well on my way with my other sleeve and um, uh, the back of it's it's I'm, I'm I'm well on my way and off to the races so um, this is going well I have the way that it worked out with my gauge and everything I have to do um, like if you count one two three four I have to do uh, eight of these so I've done four I'm just starting the the fifth I uh, sorry I've done three I'm just starting the fourth and then I need to do um, basically I have five more and so if you count it all the way down the sleeve I have five and then and then the ribbing so I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So slowly but surely. I really actually honestly I was really hoping that it would be done for today and that I would have two big projects to talk about. We would go through them. That's all we would do today. We wouldn't do community participation but um, it's not quite there. So it's something to look forward to for next next show. Yeah I know the Amish always leave a mistake and uh, Kay Facet talks about that. He always intentionally leaves a mistake as well. So very interesting. The Turkish do as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, because only only God or Allah is perfect. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Actually, Diane, that's a great idea. You could do a, a flower and duplicate stitch if it will bug you. That's actually a good idea. Or miss the sleeve. No, I don't think I'll do it on both sides because it would highlight it. Um, I think once it's in the round, you won't see it. Like once I put it on, you it's underneath. You can't actually see it. Um, and to be honest, if anybody's looking at my underarms that closely, I think that's on them. Like, that's their problem. <laughs> that's what I think. I just have to let it go. Um, so that was, um, that's pressed flowers. And then newspaper, this is the one by Hohi Locatelli that I cast on in sort of a, you know, post Fibers West excitement of wanting to start something new. And um, I bought the yarn from... Catherine of Small Bird Workshop. It's uh, Brooke Fingering uh, from Gathering Yarn and it's coral and dark brown because I wanted a warm sweater. I wanted something something that I could wear in the fall um, that would be a really like like look warm, not just be warm, but actually look warm. The whole thing is brioche. Um, so that is a certain degree of intensity when it comes to knitting because you're knitting every single row, like every row has to be gone around twice. But I thought instead of trying to fart around with changing up Diana and changing her outfit and getting up and moving around and doing all that kind of stuff, I actually thought I would just take photos of where I'm at and show you via photos. So these aren't really super high quality photos, they're just done on my phone. But I thought, you know, it's a great way to be able to show you guys where I'm at without sort of having to go through a, a costume change. So I have separated for the sleeves. The yoke is a little bit bigger and a little bit longer than I normally would like it. However, it means I can wear a long sleeve shirt underneath and then it'll be just that little bit warmer. Um, I am really happy with how the neckline ended up turning out. I was a little bit nervous about that. So I might go back and actually pick up and finish the ribbing just to, to have that done. Weave in all those ends, have that part of the sweater completely done. And I've just started working on the third stripe. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's slow. It, it's okay. Once I'm finished pressed flowers, this will be my primary knit. So I'm not too concerned. Um, it'll get done uh, because it will get done. <laughs> I also am thinking about working on the sleeves before I finish the body. I have to wind the other two skeins of yarn anyways because I'll need all, all four skeins and I thought you know I could wind them and I could do this the, the sleeves and then go back and finish the body because what a great win that would be so I am thinking about that and I'm really happy with how it's turned out I did modify it I didn't do the extra there was another 24 rows of yoke um, because my row gauge is so far off of the pattern, I stopped after the second stripe, which was after, I think it was after the second yoke repeat. 
and I went straight into the body. So that was one big change that I made. Um, I modified the pattern and I didn't do that third set of yoke increases because the, 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 the sweater fits. Um, it's perfect. I'm right between sizes. If you take into like, if you go back to Hohi's photo here, she is so, she is beautiful. Like I just, oh, when we were in Argentina, I spent the whole time just staring at the people. They are beautiful. I mean, most like South Americans are anyways, but like, and it was the same in Chile, like, but it, Argentina, the women dress beautifully. And, um, we were all over Buenos Aires and we, we were in a couple of other places as well. And I just was struck again and again and again at, at, at just the, the people, the people, they were amazing. Anyhow, you can see here on Hohi, it's not tight at all. There's a really lovely relaxed fit to the sweater. It really suits her. It looks really like it fits well. It's, it's, it's just the total package. And so what I did was I tried to stop the yoke decrease increases where it made sense in the pattern to get that same effect on my body because I'm I'm not I'm not as tall as Hohi the funny thing is our bust measurement is similar so I often do knit the size that she recommends for like that she says that she's wearing I often knit that size when I do her patterns but for this I do need it ever so slightly smaller than the pattern than the size that she knit but I didn't want to cast on the smaller size because I did want a slightly more relaxed fit. So I did cast on, I think it was the size medium and usually I cast on size small, but for this one, she's wearing the medium. I cast on the medium. And then, like I said, I stopped when I got to the length that I needed in here to give me the ease that I wanted. So I hope that makes sense. If you guys have any questions, please um, go ahead and ask. Yeah. <laughs> Eve says if they're looking that closely at your arm, you have a different problem. Exactly. Yeah. So that is newspaper. I'm excited about this sweater. I don't know why. I, I'm not usually a big brioche fan and I'm not a big textured pattern fan, which we've just spent the last hour talking about texture and pattern. So I just completely contradicted myself. What I like is low contrast. I like, I like very neutral. Um, I really like the, the warm, um, <laughs> I'm going to use our year of color, um, uh, vernacular. I, I like the warm chromatic darks. I really like, like even with pressed flowers, um, that, that dark brown yarn, it is chromatic. You look closely at it and there's greens in there and yellows and blues. And, um, there's one flower. I'm hoping I can get it. I don't know how I'll be able to phot photograph it, but there's one flower on this entire sweater. <laughs> I was looking at the sweater last night. It's a perfect rainbow. It's a chromatic dark, but it's a, it's a perfect rainbow. The, just the way the yarns lined up in the flower incredible that to me is um where i get really excited as you can see um that kind of stuff where you have to actually study something and look at it same with this where you have to look at it and be like hey what is this um that to me is um where what's interesting whereas um and then just keeping everything else simple so that when you look at like say an outfit you're really just seeing a warm golden yellow white with dark jeans but then when you get up close you see, oh, there's all of this ribbing and all of this lace and how is that done? And no, there's no, you don't need any, um, this looks like cabling and yet you don't need any, um, you don't need any cable needle to do any of this, right? And oh, this looks like I-cord, but oh, it's not I-cord. It's actually just a rolled hem. How did she do that? Um, before anybody asks, this is Marie Chen by Isabel Kramer. <laughs> I have, I've, I haven't worn it a ton. I was trying to figure out why. Um, and I realized actually last week why I was kind of digging around and trying to figure out, we've redone our closet and everything. I'll show you photos once it's totally done. And I was trying to figure out like for our clothing philosophy, why I haven't worn it. Cause it's my color, right? It's my favorite color. Uh, it's because I spun the yarn in my dad died August 1st of 2019. And I spent the rest of the summer spinning this yarn. Um, it was Clen Forest that Diana and I had gotten the fleece. We had split it. She had helped me cart up all these bats. And then I put them in my stash and didn't spin them because I just didn't feel confident enough. And so I pulled them out right after my dad died. And I sat on the front porch right out here in, in front of where I'm 
filming. And I just spun and spun and spun and spun and spun. And then I started knitting and I knit and knit and knit. And Katrina very graciously, very kindly dyed all the yarn for me in my favorite color, Goldfinch. If you're looking on her website, it's Goldfinch. And um, I think that's why I didn't wear, I, I kind of put it away. I was like, that's that done. And uh, I pulled it out a few weeks ago and I was, I tried it on and I really liked how loose it was and how the fit, it's more baggy than, than I, um, liked my clothes back then but now I really like my clothes quite baggy and I put it on and I thought yes this I let's give this sweater new life so I did all right um let's go into community participation because I know this show is getting very long <laughs> All right, this is kind of exciting because this time round, what I noticed on the Slack channel in particular was that we are, there is a ton of spindling again. We're getting to the summer. It's almost time for spindle spun summer. So uh, that will start, uh, our spindle spun summer along will start at the end of June. And um, th that's really exciting. Um, it's good to see people pulling out their spindles more and more. So I'm excited to share that with you. Before we get to that, we have our Year of Color stuff. So this is sharing some of the stuff that you guys are making that's uh, part of our Year of Color. And uh, Dominique shares um, that she made four different greens from cool and warm yellow and cyan blue. Now I try to reproduce some cool yellows, including the one my color wheel, uh, what the one on my color wheel called Chartreuse. I test knit a little, a new hexagon flower, and in the background is uh, the background color is more difficult. It will contrast with the green, but not much with the yellow petals. Uh, and this wildflower of Norway, I can't say that, <laughs> is Gagia Lutia. I probably just completely botched it, but aren't those beautiful, those greens and that bright yellow? And we've got a theme today, you guys, theme. Um, this is from Sam. She made her color wheel. Um, Eve is asking for a spinning spoon update. To be honest with you, I haven't been doing a lot of spindle spinning recently because I've been trying to get uh, pressed flowers done. Um, but this summer, this summer. So this is general makes. This is just all the stuff that I collect um, as the weeks go on um, that we uh, you know, have, have been making and stuff that we've been sharing and people have been talking about, questions, bobbin photos. And this is where all of the spindles started to pop up. So before we get to those, this is from Ruth. She's down to the last 33 grams of singles. And of course it's bittersweet. Um, sorry about that. No, no, stop. Um, and of course it's bittersweet. Um, she took this beautiful purple Romney and then she added gray and I think she had Tessa Silk in there as well. She posted it on the Slack channel and she's making this incredible yarn. Ruth always has these incredible like legacy projects going. I just think they're wonderful. And then she designs these sweaters to go with them. Anyways, stay tuned because I'm really curious to see what this is going to turn into in terms of the sweater that she's um, working on. And I get it when she said like it's getting bittersweet, like she's getting towards the end. Um, of course it is. Like you're getting to the end of a project and you know, you're enjoying the spinning so much and you don't really want it to end. Like, how could you not feel that way? Of course you would, yeah. And you're excited for what's coming and excited for the garment and to cast it on and to get to that next step. But in the meantime, it's, yeah, of course it's bittersweet. It's both. This is from Brittany. So this weekend I finally convinced my husband to use the lathe in my dad's shop. He didn't ask me how long of a spindle he should turn, but he managed to make a spindle that spins. Mind you, not a long spin, but it does spin fast. I painted the fur with some metallic paint and coated the spindle with a polyurethane clear coat. Beautiful. And I know, Brittany, some people use um, just spinning, var like um, um, water varnish, um, my goodness, wood varnish for uh, finishing their spindles. Like they'll just use a little bit of like Danish wood oil um, to finish it off so you still have that, you have that tackiness a little, teeny teeny tiny bit but you still have the the lovely feel of the wood so you can get a good a good hard spin that's another another option too yeah 
This is from Diana Targi on a Spanish peacock Tibetan. Isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? I just love that. I have to get the chat back. I lost chat. <laughs> chat, where are you? Let me see if I can get you guys. Hang on. Just give me a sec here because, nope, wrong way. Hello. We ha Did I tell you guys? We had a whole bunch of computer stuff happen last week. I did tell you. And uh, we've. Lo I'm having to relearn everything because we had to redo everything. And then Windows forced the newest update to the newest Windows, which is not what we wanted. Anyhow, whining and moaning, complaining aside. So... This is from Lisa. I treated myself to a new tackly and a singing bowl from John. Is is it Galen or Galen or get Ga Yeah, it's Galen, isn't it? Look at that spin. Oh, incroyable. Beautiful. And look at the top of that tackly. Look at those. Look at it. It's still going. Amazing. So much fun to, I could just watch this all day. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? It's so sparkly, so sparkly. You can't really see it in the photo either. Like the video really helps because the light catches it as it's moving uh, towards the end there. So it's just so perfect. Um, congratulations, Lisa, what a beautiful spindle. This is from Lee, I did a thing. This is from Alan Berry, for those who are wondering. I have a couple of his spindles and I also have a spin, spinning spoon um, that was gifted to me by Eve. And um, yeah, he does these sets of things and you can, it's all custom. You talk to him about the designs that you like and want and he does it all for you. And I have noticed his carvings are getting more and more like um, detailed. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but his carving is getting like more and more and more detailed and it's beautiful. Amazing. This is from Nicole. Uh, I made a new thing. I made this pretty little spinning bowl and I have to say she works. Um, she works awesome. It fits perfectly into my lap and man the spindle goes like stink. Now I feel like I have, yes, it's a video. Look at that thing go on her bowl. She made this bowl. Isn't that, and then this uh, spindle, I think this is a Mirkwood spindle. Um, it's got those beads at the top, that's very Mirkwood. It has that Mirkwood look and feel to it and the shaft looks like a Mirkwood shaft. Not that I am obsessed with Mirkwood spindles or anything, but um, it looks like a Mirkwood. If it looks like a Mirkwood and it sings like a Mirkwood and it sparkles like a Mirkwood, it's probably a Mirkwood. This is from Megan. All right, enough with the spindles because I could just look at them all day. Hello everyone, I finished plying this yarn and I am so proud of how it ended. I made a spinning goal on my wheel. Oh wait, um, where is her? This is not her yarn, there we go. This is her sweater. I put in the wrong photo. She finished this incredible sweater. It was her legacy project, another legacy project. Um, it's a Marie Wallen, I'm pretty sure. And um, so I, I cut and pasted, the. I, I put the wrong photo with the wrong text. So I'm sorry about that, you guys. Maybe you'll see it later. <laughs> um, her yarn and I've just mixed them up by accident. But this sweater and the cherry blossoms, Megan, I just can't even. Isn't that incredible, all that knitting. Amazing, amazing. This is from Adri. At, um, at, then I experimented a bit on my crumps, drop spindles and got my yarn. So she'd been spinning some other yarn um, that she was sharing, but aren't these little skeins just wonderful? She's been playing with her drop spindles. More spindling, more spindle spinning. You guys, with your spindle spinning, you're, I, I need to get mine out. So this is the yarn that she was working on. Um, I finished plying this yarn. I'm so proud of how it ended. I made a goal of spinning on my wheel in my vacation daily for 15 minutes. It's the most consistent yarn I have ever done. Um, so I guess I copy and pasted Adri's um, stuff instead of Megan's stuff when she said about her sweater. So let me just see if I can go back. Here it is. I am sorry about that. Okay, give me a sec, because it's important that we celebrate Megan um, as well. Because Megan, there we go. Now let's do it again. 
<laughs> it is finished. My Henry VIII uh, by Alice Starmore is done. Sorry, I said Maureen Wallen. I meant Alice Starmore. I was thinking Alice Starmore. Um, it is such a masterpiece. Not This was an epic knit that I started in October. I love it. Not hand spun. This is Holst Super Soft, although I am currently spinning 14 colors to have a hand spun Marie Wallen. That's why I had Marie Wallen in my head. Isn't that amazing? Congratulations, Megan. That is a huge accomplishment. And thank you for sticking with me, you guys, on that for just a sec. All right, this is from Purinelle. I love this. This is so much fun. Um, I'm not going to read all of this just because it's a lot, but last year I bought an advent calendar and I had never done that before because the cheap chocolatey kinds don't count. Um, so she had been looking at those mini, at, at those with minis, but I don't need more yarn and I don't really understand minis yet. There's that yet again. But then I found this fiber advent calendar died after a picture and I just really needed it. <laughs> of course you did. Um, the fibers were from Germany. It is Falkland. It is a, has been a joy to spin. Aren't these photos incredible? That photo, I love that one. Um, what I knew before uh, buying was that the fiber had more had been dyed as one long strip of wool and then divided into 24 bumps. I wanted to see it all before beginning to spin, so I kind of needed to see where it went. I think that it went really beautiful. So she ended up spinning the first ply end to end. So she uh, took all of the advent calendar, she lined it all up, she, she spun it all end to end as it had originally been dyed, and then she divided uh, the second third she divided into two and then the third she divided into four and she basically did a fractal. It's just amazing. Um, so she's going to make a swatch and um, she's thinking that it could be a pressed flowers and then she also had her eye on um, the shifty which would also work really really well. Beautiful. Thank you, Pranil. Her spinning is always so beautiful. So well done. There's, you guys, you and your spinning, all of you, incredible. Thank you, you guys. Thank you for sharing and being so open with your learning journeys, for taking the time, for uploading stuff, for sharing with one another, giving each other feedback, helping each other. It really does make a huge difference and uh, it keeps things going. It keeps us sharing. It really fosters that love of hand spun yarn and that love of working with yarn and, and you know, trying to push ourselves be a little bit better than yesterday. So Thank you again. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful couple of weeks. I will see you again here. I can't believe it's February. It's May 2nd. Um, and then we have the next live will be on May 16th. And then we've got the premiere on the 30th. So we've got a nice spread of content this month that you guys can uh, jump in and out as you feel called and, and whatever works for you. So I hope you enjoyed today's show. I hope you have a wonderful couple of weeks. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope that it's getting a little bit sunny where you are and that you're able to get outside a little bit and um, have a wonderful, a wonderful couple of weeks. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you to Anne, Sarah, Amanda, and Lisa. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much.